Um, hi, I'm Grant Garcia um, from Orthopedic Specials of Seattle. I do sports medicine and shoulder, uh, as well as biologics. Uh, and today for View Medi, we're going to do updates uh, in the treatment of osteoarthritis. So, what is the need? Well, osteoarthritis, as we know, is quite common. You know, over 52 million in the U.S. are diagnosed with osteoarthritis, and this can range from the knee, shoulder, hip, ankle, etc. 62% of these people are over 65 years old, and this number continues to grow as our patient population ages. There are over 1 million joint replacements performed each year, and again, this is also continuing to increase exponentially. So medical management. So these are the current recommended drugs, and this is a good table I got from uh, one of the more recent articles. And this goes over all the, the medical management of arthritis. So it starts off with acetaminophen, and again, you can see the three major groups, AOS, ACR, and um, OARSI, and their recommendations. And hopefully you guys can see this on the screen. Uh, then you have uh, non-selective NSAIDs. And again, we always try these in patients first, unless there's some contraindication for them. And then there's some more selective um, COX-2 inhibitors. Again, pa patients, depends on who they are, do better or worse with these. Uh, and these are recommended for symptomatic uh, different arthritis. And you can see here, that the recommendation depends on whether it's knee, hip, um, or hand, or shoulder, uh, based off the of recommendation from the AAOS. And then you have something, uh, you know, opioid analgesics, mostly tramadol, um, for sometimes in these patients that need to get through acute flares. Uh, SNRIs, uh, I don't usually prescribe those, uh, but that is something that um, it wasn't really included as in the, uh, the ACR, American College of Rheumatology, did mention is a possibly conditionally recommended in patients over 75. And then we get to the bulk of the treatment options that most of us as orthopedic surgeons take care of. So you have intraarticular corticosteroids. Again, AOS tends to be strict on their criteria, so inconclusive, conditionally recommended in other groups, um, and other ones for moderate to severe pain who failed these other anti-inflammatory drugs. And then finally, uh, intraarticular hyaluronic acid, I mean, we'll get into this very briefly next, um, but you know, no longer recommended by the AAOS. And there's some discussion about whether or not that's appropriate. Um, and in the, uh, the Osteoarthritis Research Society said it may still be useful in patients with knee and hip OA. So you have to take all these things with a grain of salt. Again, this is our basic armamentarium before we start talking about other options such as biologics. So corticosteroids, so office-based, this is a study from 2009, Again, it's an effective short-term treatment, but the problem is it's for a chronic problem. And it did show, you know, in this study, in this sort of review, uh, significant relief about a week. You know, patients in my practice can vary anywhere from no effect to a few weeks to a month to a year. So it just really depends on the patient and it doesn't always line up with their x-rays. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is that, you know, here's a study from 2017, and this is what we see in general practice, especially the longer you're in practice. Um, this is intraarticular corticosteroids for three months, every for 24 months, every three months for 24 months. And this is, they were all kale grade two or three. And what they found on MRI was they had a cartilage loss. So the cartilage loss was less in the, um, was more in the uh, corticosteroid group versus the saline group. And this is what we're seeing in practice too, is that at two years, there's actually more significant loss of cartilage in the treatment group versus no dip, but there was no difference in the knee pain outcome at that time. So the patients got some short-term relief, but the long-term relief was not any different to doing nothing at that two-year mark. And so some may, you may theorize, you know, and this is, we're always still trying to tease this out, uh, but whether or not the, they're getting more cartilage loss because they're more active or they're getting more cartilage, cartilage, um, cartilage loss from the actual medication itself. We tend to think it's more of the medication, but again, there's still more studies that we're doing on this. And I still do offer this as a primary treatment for my patients because it's one of the only ones that's covered by insurance. So let's talk about hyaluronic acid. Again, this is controversial, depends on the person you talk to. Um, this is the AOS public commentary, strong recommendation against the use of HA. And we probably remember a few years ago, we used to be able to take HAS off the shelves, you know, Synvisc, Orthovisc, whatever you use, and inject into the patients. Well, as a result of this recommendation, immediately there was a big, big uh, landslide and their insurance company stopped paying for it. Surprisingly, now Medicare still does pay for it and occasional other um, providers, 
but the majority of the private payers have not uh, continued, have continued to not pay for this. And the consequences of this were, again, they use the minimal clinical difference between the treatment groups rather than within. There was 15 as in major non-coverage decisions made by this. But the problem is that this is still shown in some studies can postpone total knee replacement between three to seven years. And again, it's still a divisive topic among membership. So while again, this is a AOS sort of full on um, guidelines, there are still people that use hyaluronic acid um, both in combination with PRP, which we may talk about later, um, or is in isolation. And again, there's still some insurances that do pay for it. It's just that majority of them have stopped. So what's the current landscape in 2021? So here is the orthobiologic options. And again, there was orthokines as well. We don't really have time to do that today because we're gonna just briefly talk about surgical options as well. Um, so uh, we have PRP and there's three types of, two types of PRP and the third type we'll talk about as well. And then you have stem cells. This is a very hot topic. There's millions and millions of searches for this every year. There's millions and millions of stem cell clinics, you know, whether you feel negative or positive about them, you know, that may advertise inappropriately. And so it gives the orthopedic surgeon who offers some of these options uh, a bad name. And so hopefully today, at least we get a very brief overview of this. And we also have some information. Um, I've done some talks on this previously. So uh, there's the autologous uh, stem cells. So you have marrow. Um, there's something um, called bursal. So you take it from the bursa. This is again, a procedure. So you're using a, um, an aura, aura, a shaver to collect the bursal tissue. And then this is going into a contraption where they stimulate these stem cells. This is still more of the experimental, the marrow is not. And then there's synovial um, where they can take it from the actual synovium. And this is still again, uh, clinical trials type of thing. And then there's adipose tissue where you can actually extract um, like lipogems um, from the fat uh, and inject these stem cells back. And then you have allogeneic so you have adipose, marrow, and then the most commonly used one, especially for uh, non-orthopedic surgeons, um, is the cord or amnion blood um, that we see. So talking briefly about PRP, again, when we take the blood, we spin it down, and there's uh, three types of PRP you can get. There's the PRP uh, with leukocyte pores, so low white blood cells. As you can see, you get very little white blood cells, and you get a moderate amount of platelets. The second is pure PRP. There's really not a lot of data on benefits of the pure PRP, but there are more and more studies looking at this and what else we can we use this for. And then you have the leukocyte rich PRP. Again, you see here, you have a lot of white blood cells, but you also have a lot, you also have more platelets than you would with the leukocyte poor. So keep this in mind um, when you talk about the two uses for them. So how do these sort of platelets, the platelets release these activation factors? Uh, and again, these are growth factors when activated, and these growth factors can have various effects. When I talk to my patients, I usually tell them, you know, there's a series of growth factors. It depends on the type of PRP that we use, but sometimes the goal is just potent anti-inflammatory properties. Other times the goal is to actually help the tendon heal or promote inflammation in that area to allow the tendon to heal. So you can have these uh, promote cell growth and new generation repair. Uh, this is the platelet-derived growth factor. You can have fibro, uh, the fibroblast growth factors epithelial growth factors, VEGF we all know of, and TGF beta. So all of these can help with the process. And that's the whole goal of these injections is to accelerate this process, depending on the type of formula that you use. So here's a study. I think this is really gets the STEM and help, will help people understand how we use PRP and what types of PRP. So this looked at, you know, PPP, straight red blood cells, leukocyte rich is LR, leukocyte poor is, uh, again, LP. So you can see here, the best part is look at the bottom right-hand corner, and this looks at synovial site viability. So you can see here that the there are a lot more inflammatory markers, inflammatory properties of the leukocyte rich. So if you want to cause inflammation and cause certain cells of the immune system to go to the, that part, you want to use a leukocyte rich PRP. And that's why tendinopathies, uh, hamstring, um, labocondylitis, medial epicondylitis, patella tendinitis, uh, tend to be the inflammatory uh, are the ones you want to have the repair cells go to and the inflammatory markers to sort of to sort of attack the damaged tissue and help repair it. So that's why you use a leukocyte rich. Leukocyte poor has a lot more anti-inflammatory properties to it, IL-4 and IL-10. And so this is what we use for a lot for arthritic issues or cartilage issues where we want to try PRP before going through a surgical, um, going through a surgical uh, procedure. 
And so this is the, so leukocyte poor is more for the arthritis and tendinopathies are more the leukocyte rich. Um, and we can't have time right now to go into all the different indications for these, uh, but that's just a brief overview. So looking more at the arthritis, this is a safety and efficacy, uh, looking at leukocyte poor. Again, so leukocyte poor for arthritis versus saline. So 15 patients per group, this is a placebo controlled trial, FDA sanctioned, double blind. Um, so again, the, so the PRP had three injections, which is one of the regimens that we use. We'll mention that in a bit. And the effect timing was roughly two to four weeks. So this is what I tell my patients when they get PRP, whether they do a single shot or a th round of three, um, to expect the results or start feeling the results usually between two to four weeks. I usually give them more of the four week window uh, to be conservative. And you can see here that the PRP group um, at, had a major improvement at 12 months. So 70% PRP versus 7% in the saline. And you can see that, you know, after two weeks, the placebo effect is clearly gone. And there's statistical significance um, at with a p-value of 0, uh, 0 0.015 at two weeks. So again, this is another comparison. It's always good to know this because I think that some people get confused as to when you use leukocyte poor or rich. And again, there's certain machines that can do both of them. So you don't have to buy two or three machines to have this op option. So these are all these different studies looking at this and you can see they compared, uh, some of these were hyaluronic acid versus PRP, some were placebo versus PRP. But really in the end to understand that leukocyte poor for our knee arthritis is better than hyaluronic acid, leukocyte rich or placebo alone. And so the go-to for majority of us is to do a leukocyte poor injection of PRP, whether it be one or three. Well, does number matter? Well, here's a study, this is from 2019 from AJSM, 36 pigs, there were three treatments arms. So there was control, there was the PR, single shot PRP, three shots PRP. At three months, and again, the bottom is the articular score they used. So at three months, the both the PRP single shot and triple shot groups were still better than the control. But at six months, the triple shot group did much better. So again, there's an accumulative effect of hitting the, hitting the person's knee with PRP every week for three weeks versus a single shot. In practice, depending on where you are, I'm in private practice, it can be quite expensive uh, to do three rounds of PRP. So I don't always go to that. I usually start off with a single shot, um, but if they were to say, I got good relief, but let's say it lasted six months, then you may offer, okay, the third three round may be a better option for you. It kind of depends on how you do your practice. Um, but the three shots, at least in some more recent studies, have demonstrated a little bit more long-term effectiveness. So multiple PRP injections are needed for long-term effect past six months. So again, looking at the outcomes of PRP, you can see here, there are two studies that showed more pain and swelling. This is from Dragoo um, from 2014. Um, but you can see those two studies use leukocyte rich. So again, if you give the wrong injection, the results are not the same. So a significant improvement um, on the first one versus saline, then the other one was versus hyaluronic acid, another one hyaluronic acid, another one hyaluronic acid. And again, you'll see here, and we bring this up in other previous studies, there are a lot of different ways that people make PRP, that machines are not regulated. So it's something to be aware of that the formulation you're using there's two spins, you can see your triple spin, it just depends on the, the formula you're using. And again, they all give pretty good results, but it's, under, it's important to understand that not everything that you see in studies is all the same and controlled and calibrated. So we're not gonna have a lot of time to go over these in extensive detail. Again, there is still a lot more data that needs to be collected for stem cells. But again, you have the embryonic, mesenchymal, adipose-derived, umbilical cord, and then the induced pluripotent, which is the one that we all wanna get. We want to be able to give someone an injection, have it turn into whatever the tissue we want to regenerate um, and improve their knees or hips or ankle or whatever you want. So the traditional thinking is that we inject these cells and then let's say we want to have cartilage regenerate. We inject it, the cartilage generates, and that's a great option. And then we are able to significantly improve patients' lives. Well, unfortunately for the most part, and again, we may be getting closer with newer data out there. It's really the contemporary thinking is that these are extremely potent anti-inflammatories. So they decrease inflammation, they recruit other stem cells who that secrete further growth factors, and they're again, pro-inflammatory and then immunosuppressive at the same time. And so as a result, this injection option for someone with damage to their knee really is just an extension of what we have for PRP. 
And so again, you know, most of us still will go with the PRP first over trying to talk about stem cells. And again, as you know, with stem cells uh, being physicians is that stem cells could mean anything. You know, I told you about the, all different types of stem cell options. There's a lot of different options. Each one has different outcomes. The one that I tend to use the most is bone marrow aspirate, again, more for high level athletes. And this is looking at cartilage injuries and arthritis. And again, we, don't, we won't go over this extensively. You can see encouraging results. They didn't provide uh, for the adipose, but looked at mostly bone marrow. And all of these had some type of improvement overall. But again, there's, they're not without some complications, occasional swelling, occasional pain. And we're getting better at doing these things in the office too. So you can do your bone marrow aspirate in the office. But again, most of us still sometimes will do it as a secondary portion of the procedure. So you do your bone marrow aspirate with your knee scope. And then at the end of your knee scope, you can do the injection. Um, and that will be, that's something that we do occasionally. Um, you can see here significant improvement in the Tegner scores, Lysum scores, significant improvement in all scores in these different patient populations. Now, again, some of these patients are younger. You see the mean age range is 48, 46. So the way I feel and what I've seen um, with these is that the if you can find something that's pain but less damage than sort of a very stage four arthritic knee, they tend to do better than patients with less, uh, with more, uh, they tend to do better with less arthritis than more. And there's a study I have in one of my previous talks uh, showing that. And again, this is microfracture. These are bone marrow aspirate scaffold. A lot of times we're using these stem cells in conjunction with the procedure, and this tends to be even more useful, um, but we don't have the time today to go into that. So we'll go into this very briefly, um, and again, for the sake of time, so management surgical. So uh, again, this is people that have failed all those things I previously talked about, or it's cost prohibitive, so they want to continue on and just try to make themselves better with other options. And this is the most important part. So those patients with mild OA, so again, it may only involve one or two parts of the compartment that may be correctable. The problem is that some surgeons who are less versed in cartilage or meniscus may see a patient, and I saw one today that was 30 years old, uh, that was told she had arthritis of her knee and there's nothing that could happen for her. But it turns out she just has a very bad meniscus and she has complete meniscal deficiency with some cartilage thinning on her femoral condyle, and that can be corrected in the right situation. So a number of younger patients have been told they needed to, they have arthritis and need a replacement, but many of them just need a cartilage procedure or a meniscus restoration. So a transplant, some Macy or a cartilage transplant, et cetera. So it's important to understand that not everybody with what we define as osteoarthritis or what some doctor defines as osteoarthritis may be different to the cartilage surgeon. But again, there's lots of cases where it's very straightforward. You know, people with moderate to severe arthritis, you know, joint space narrowing, osteophytes forming, et cetera, you know, someone in their 50s or 40s or 50s or 60s, it's a different animal. Usually start off sometimes with arthroscopic debridement, depending on the patient, um, depending on how you feel about that procedure. There's high tibial osteotomy. Again, it's fallen out of favor, but it's, I think it's coming back, especially with newer uh, training options and understanding that alignment is really important and you don't want to miss you know, that 46 year old that's got continued knee pain on the inside of his knee and do a uni on him when he's got 10 degrees of varus. Um, partial knee replacement has been a fantastic option and uh, total knee replacement as well. So again, we, this is more for the cartilage portion of it, but again, this is how you prevent arthritis, how you manage early arthritis in those young patients, understanding everything about the knee. Um, and then we're talking morally about the knee uh, today with this, but you understand malalignment. If they have malalignment, correct it with an osteotomy. If they have deficiency of their meniscus with good cartilage, you do a meniscus uh, transplant. And again, these are all the different alignment procedures that you have to understand if you're gonna do this. And again, it's a Venn diagram as you see there on the bottom right. So the first option that we will talk about very briefly is high tibial osteotomy. And sorry, one of my images is not showing up. Um, indication, again, unicompartment arthritis, either varus or valgus, depending on whatever it is. Um, any patient in my office that's got single compartment wear um, that is, uh, sorry, should be less than 50, um, they get alignment films. And so those alignment films I measure, if a patient's got significant arthritis on one compartment isolated, which is not that common, um, and they've got more than um, four or five degrees of uh, varus, I'll think about doing a high tib tibial osteotomy. If they have lateral compartment arthritis and they're you know, in their early uh, 40s um, with a pretty fair amount, you know, four or five degrees of valgus, uh, then I will consider doing a distal femoral osteotomy. So those are something that we can do. And again, you realign the mechanical axis, and this can be quite good. There's a number of uh, studies that demonstrate that around 75% of these are still intact at 10 years. 
And if you can give a patient that's in their 40s that long, that longevity to avoid to have knee replacement, that's a pretty good option. And again, you want to have patients with this with less than 15 degrees of deformity. So the next option is a partial knee replacement. This is very common now. Again, unique compartment arthritis. It's most commonly medial compartment. Again, you want you don't want to have a lot of deformity. So those patients that we saw previously, if they have a lot of deformity, they may be having to do an osteotomy before worrying about getting a knee replacement. Uh, partial, or they may have to go straight to a total if they have too much deformity, because you can overload that uni compartment. This is one that a lot of surgeons forget about. Don't forget about the patellofemoral placement. You know, everyone feels differently about them. I, I personally do patellofemoral placements, and I've seen a lot of really good successful results. Again, not the same longevity as a uni compartment, uh, medial or uh, medial uni, but there are a lot of females and mostly females and males with severe patellofemoral arthritis from multiple dislocations, et cetera, that have good isolated compartments and can't do anything they want to do uh, and are really, really disabled. And this can be a great option. And again, you see here, uni compartments for uh, medial, and there's some data on lateral as well, uh, 90% at 10 years. And a patellofemoral replacement is about 75% at 10 years, and mainly because of where in the other compartments, because these patients tend to be slightly younger in the patellofemoral group than they are for the medial uh, uni group. And finally, knee replacement. Again, this is the final straw. Um, indications, diffuse arthritis, severe pain, uh, functional impairment. Um, again, the pain relief uh, is usually greater than the functional gain, so it's always important for patients to understand that. Um, depends on the type of implant you use. The ACL can be sacrificed. Uh, the PCLs may also be sacrificed, sometimes they're PCL sparing. And then the prosthesis survival is around 90% at 10 years. And again, this is, depends on the study you look at. Some are more, some are better. Um, but that's the uh, overall rundown of sort of the management that uh, I use. And there's some the current management of osteoarthritis um, in uh, standard patient in clinic. Thank you.